Harry Warner is supposed to have said in 1927, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? He didn't think that talking pictures would ever take off, and how wrong was he? Uh, Daryl Zanuck, uh, head of another uh, uh, big uh, film company, said, TV won't be able to hold on to any market after the first six months. People get tired of staring at a box every night. And how wrong did he prove to be? Um, this is Western Union's president rejecting an offer to buy the telephone for $100,000. What use could my company make of an electrical toy, was his opinion. And this is perhaps the most uh, remarkable because it was made as late as 1977 by Ken Olson, who was the president at that time of one of the biggest computer companies in the world, uh, DEC. He said, there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. In 1977, the same year that Bill Gates and his friends uh, at Microsoft and Steve Jobs and his friends at Apple had made it their mission to get a computer into every home. I think that captures the difference in mindset between the big successful companies and the small hungry ones. I often ask uh, people from big companies when I'm talking to them, do you think your big company is, is inert, arrogant or too complacent, incompetent, stuck in the past? Are some of these things familiar to you? And often they say yes. They recognize these kinds of traits. They recognize that success often breeds these kinds of attitudes. Yeah, Jim. Those quotes yeah. struck me that they just lack curiosity almost. Yes. And they're sort of making a point about yeah. being curious about yeah. someone's yeah. work. Yeah. yeah. This lack of curiosity, maybe it's born from complacence. Maybe it's because they're so you know, involved with what exists. And so their imaginations are not caught up by what could be. Exactly. So, so it is a very interesting psychological mindset issue as much as anything else. Well, I don't think anyone seeks to be that. Nobody seeks to, but they recognize this description because they see it's happened, and success and size sometimes brings that about. A couple of co-authors of uh, friends of mine and co-authors of mine decided to actually test this hypothesis. Was it true that in the 20th century, most innovations came from these hungry startups, or did they come from established large companies? So they looked at a bunch of recognizable radical innovations that all of us would probably recognize, everything from the VCR to the laser printer to the electric blanket, cell phone, et cetera. And they went back to original documents to see who was the first company to actually introduce these products. Um, and they, wanted, they classified them as being incumbents, established successful companies, or outsiders, new companies, startups. 50-50, uh, but, but there was an interesting split. They found that the pattern was very different pre-World War II. Some of those things came out before the World War and post-World War II. And the split actually favored the large companies. So post-World War II, the majority of the innovations that came out came from large companies. Despite all these problems that companies might face, uh, they nevertheless were responsible for more of those. And why? Well, they say, well, technologies are more complex. New organizational forms have become popular. Innovation is more global. So really, in order to do this, you need to have resources. And only the big companies really have that. And if they have all these organizational problems, they can solve them, especially if they are aware of the pitfalls. And gosh, have they become aware of the pitfalls. They've seen what's happened to Kodak and a whole bunch of others, and they don't want to go that way. So really, large companies do have a lot going for them. Essentially, they have resources that can help them to innovate. They have technological resources, human resources, marketing resources like brands, and if all else fails, they have money to buy good ideas or incorporate them into their business. By definition, there are going to be more good ideas outside your company than inside. So how can the large companies tap into that stuff happening outside? So every year, Business Week has a list of the world's most innovative companies, and very often, a company like P&G will be on it. Why is P&G on that list? If you look at P&G in 2000, it looked like a very traditional, classic 20th century, in-house, R&D heavy company. Here are some stats. Huge number of people employed to do R&D stuff. Huge amounts of money spent on it. Uh, lots of patents, but importantly, many of them were not actually being commercially exploited. Remember Schumpeter's point. It's not just new ideas. It's exploiting the new ideas. 
stagnation of the R&D. It wasn't really doing what they wanted it to do in terms of having successful products. And because the products were not really successful, they were having to spend more to support them through advertising. So it wasn't really working. So from 2002, we see a big shift in uh, PNG's fortunes. Their sales start to grow, and their stock price doubles. How do they do that? How do they transform their ability to get more with less? This is what they did. Their CEO issued a call to action in 2002. He said, we're going to move from R&D to C and D, connect and develop. And we're going to target by 2005 50% of our new products coming from ideas outside PNG. And what are we going to do? We're going to tap into that ecosystem of people that we interact with <coughs> on a daily basis, our suppliers, even our competitors, uh, manufacturers, and universities and academia. We're going to tap into that rich source of ideas. And an example of how this worked was with Pringles. I think we're all familiar with Pringles. In, uh, I think it was in around 2002, they realized this product wasn't really doing much. It sort of market share was stuck at about 10%, and they wanted to be able to make it more appealing to people. So they brainstormed, and they came up with this great idea. What if we printed quiz questions on a Pringle, and on the next Pringle, we'd have the answer? That would stimulate your thirst or appetite for knowledge. So OK, great idea. How do you actually make this happen? Technically, it's actually quite difficult to do because you have to print in edible ink legibly on a very odd surface at very high temperatures. So how do you do that? Of course, you could do that traditionally by you have an in-house budget and a team, and you give them this uh, thing, and maybe they'll work with uh, one su supplier or one uh, possibly a, a manufacturer. But they said, no, no, no. In the world of CND, we do it differently. Let's tap into our ecosystem. So, Instead, they created a short brief, a specification for what they needed to do, and they shared it in this network of theirs, including with their suppliers, universities, etc. And they, they discovered this professor in Bologna had figured out a way to print on pizza and bread. So they worked with him, and they came up with a solution to print on Pringles that they then rolled out, and it had quite a significant impact on the sales of Pringles. And for instance, attacking the mindset. Um, you have to change the mindset of people when you get them from doing everything themselves to actually working with others. And there is a well-known phenomenon of not invented here. If an idea comes from outside, nobody feels that they own it, and it dies. So they had to change that mindset from not invented here to proudly found elsewhere. So they encouraged that kind of approach. They actually found 60 people throughout the organization in PNG, some of them quite senior, many of them from middle management, who they were called technology scouts, and their role, they, became, they, get, they got time and resources to actually find new ideas from outside and bring them in. The websites that they use, so they tap into people's capabilities around the world. Uh, for instance, through this website called Innocentive, which was developed for the pharmaceutical industry for solving problems in chemistry. So anyone around the world can be a member of this website and can solve problems that are posted by people at PNG for an award. So they're able to tap into the expertise of people outside PNG for a small amount of money. Now, what are the results? Um, by 2006, they achieved their target of 50% of ideas coming from outside. The R&D productivity increased. They were able to do more with less their products became more effective in the market. They were products that people really wanted. Uh, and of course, that affected the share price. And it's not just P&G. Interestingly, P&G got the idea from this company, this Canadian mining company called Gold Corp. Um, a guy from P&G, Larry Houston, who initiated CND within uh, P&G, happened to go to a course at MIT uh, on open source uh, innovation. Uh, and he met this guy from Gold Corp who was talking about how uh, he decided to uh, open up the data that he had on his gold mine. So he inherited this gold mine in Canada, and its productivity wasn't great because he didn't know where exactly in his land the gold was. So finding the gold was proving difficult. So he set up a website and a challenge called the Gold Corp Challenge, where you could win up to that amount of money. And he shared the data, and he asked people from around the world to help him find gold on his land. And essentially, the prize was won by an Australian company, all the way across to the other end, a small company that had a way to visualize data better. And using his data, 
they were able to help him find gold. His company went from being a $100 million business to a $9 billion business as a result of that. 